Hello, everybody. Welcome to the inaugural edition of the Afternoon Astronomy Coffee Hangout here at Deep Astronomy. And we are, this is, we're trying a new hangout series. See, I knew that would happen, but I, at least I got it. So we are trying a new experiment here with a new hangout series because one of the things we like to do here on, to the subscribers of the Deep Astronomy channel is to not only get you guys introduced to the new, uh, discoveries in astronomy introduce you to the wonder and all the great things that are going on in this golden age of astronomy but we also want to give you a sense of what it's like to be an astronomer what do astronomers do in their jobs and one of the things that they do is they collaborate they have to get together and and i don't care if you work at an observatory at a university at an institute in in, in astronomy departments around the world People get together usually on a weekly basis, but maybe you know, on some maybe maybe on different frequency levels, and discuss research. They get together, they talk about astronomy, and usually it's in an astro coffee kind of format, but not, you know, not necessarily. For example, when I worked at the High Altitude Observatory in Boulder, we called it every Tuesday at three three in the afternoon. We had this thing called C cubed, which was stood for coffee cookies and conversation and we got together each week and talked about the latest research maybe maybe a paper that had just come out and things like that and so we're trying to introduce you to that uh to that paradigm and give you a sense let you participate with astronomers <coughs> about these astro coffees so and this particular hangout idea was the brainchild of my good friend and colleague uh dr carol christian hi carol it's good to be back in a hangout with you yeah, it's great, and I you really terrified me when you said you can you're going to get a flavor for what a uh, scientists really do. <laughs> well, maybe a glimpse. But the I coffee part glimpse. is really good, and yeah, science coffee is um, is really part of our culture in both the you know the research like research facilities and and universities. It's really important to discuss the research. What what the idea here is that lots of times what we do is we discuss it you know, at Science Coffee in our own home institution, but we maybe we'll have a visitor that comes in and talks to us, but sometimes we just talk about the research and the person isn't there. So the great thing about the internet is that we can all have our coffee together, <laughs> um, even though we're not sitting around the same table, but that, that's the idea, is that it's like we're having a science coffee, but we get to have the authors and the collaborators and the experts in the field all join in the discussion, um, so we're not just making stuff up. <laughs> right, and so as, exactly. So as you as you notice, we uh, we all th this is an augmentation of our week of our hangout series that we do on the we have the, the footsteps to Mars hangout, which happens on the first uh, Thursday of every month, and of course the future in space the third Thursday of every month, and in between we're going to have these astro coffees, and so we want you to participate. We want you to converse with us, have a cup of coffee ready. Whether you put Kahlua in it, it is up to you. But uh, but we do want you to participate. In the, and there's several ways to do it now. I have I'm experimenting with two of them today. So in the description, the first one, the main one, right here, Astro Coffee, the hashtag. I'm looking at it on my tweet deck right now. So if you want to ask a question, that's one of the easier ways with via Twitter. But if you go to deepastronomy.com/live and you click on there, I have a new chat window or a chat client that uh, we just are testing out now. It's in beta, so be patient, but you can also chat with us there. And finally, in the description box of this video is a Google Slides Hangout, Q&A Hangout thing. If you click on that it's uh, that, that link, I'm also looking at that uh, Q&A on, uh, on, uh, on my browser window too. So those are all the different ways you can communicate with us. So let's get started. You may have heard, and one of the things that I'm also very glad about with this Hangout series is I've been getting a lot of requests for talking about things people are in Europe are doing, the European Southern Observatory, the European Space Agency. And today we've got an announcement. Or we're going to be talking about some results that came out of some research from the European Southern Observatory that was announced a few weeks ago about an exoplanet that's in orbit around the closest star system to us, Proxima Centauri, and this is exciting news on a lot of different levels. Generated huge amounts of press, but uh, and today we've got people to who uh, we've got a member of the uh, the science collaboration that worked on it. His his name is Dr. Michael Endel. He's an astronomer at the McDonald Observatory at the University of Texas at Austin. Do you have to 
drive back, by the way, between the McDonald and, and Austin, McDonald Observatory and Austin. <laughs> oh, yeah, all the time, six yeah. and a half hours. Is it really? Wow. wow. Yeah. I didn't realize Texas, it was so far. Jeez. Texas is big. So that's Michael Endel. Yeah. He's, 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 he's on the taper that, that came out, and we're going to discuss that. Also joining us is Dr. Avi Mandel. He's a, he's an exoplanet scientist at NASA Goddard. Avi, welcome back to our Hangout. It's good to have you here and uh, talk to us about exoplanets. Yeah, thanks. It's always fun to uh, chat over coffee with you guys about these things. That's right, over coffee. That's right. Now, the so the press release itself. If you, I have a link to that also in the description box of the Hangout. If you want to follow along, read the research. There's links to the paper there that came out in Nature a couple of weeks ago. And I and so to set the stage, um, I'm going to have Mike. Can you give us some? I give us. Why don't you tell us a little bit of just a summary of the research. All right, so it's actually um, um, basically the end result of over 15 years of observing this uh, particular star. And when I finished my uh, PhD at ESO around 1999 and 2000, uh, the ESO VLT became available, which is an eight meter class telescope. And my thesis advisor, Martin Kirsten and I, we were throwing ideas at each other what we could do and one of the obvious ideas was to look at uh, very low mass stars that are very faint though, but you have now a big telescope, so you get enough photons. And then for these uh, M dwarfs like Proxima, the advantage is that the habitable zone is very close to the star because the star is so faint, of course. So the orbital periods of these planets should be much, much uh, shorter. And both of these things help the so-called radio velocity method. So we said, okay, we start observing Proxima and actually 20 other M dwarfs with the VLT, and we did this for eight years. And I, uh, then we stopped and moved on, and I, I concluded we would have seen already every two to three Earth mass planet in the habitable zone around Proxima. And then the, uh, the Geneva group used the, the HARP spectrograph, which delivers an even better radio velocity precision to, uh, to continue observing um, Proxima. And then over time, of course, the, the Kepler mission revolution in exoplanets happened, which meant that we now suddenly had this information about the, this fantastic high occurrence rates of small planets. And there was a significant number of M dwarfs also in the Kepler sample. So rough estimates out of the Kepler mission were that like a quarter of these M dwarfs should have um, uh, small planets in the habitable zone. So it was kind of almost logical that then people went on and collected then all these archival radio velocity data, put them all together. And that's what Guillaume and Glada and Miko Tuomi did. And they looked at Proxima and they identified this, this candidate signal by combining our old US data and the old uh, HARPS data. But it wasn't strong enough to really be convincing. Uh, but then Guillaume went ahead and designed the experiment the perfect experiment to very quickly you know confirm or refute this signal and that was then the the intensive observing campaign that happened earlier this year the pale red dot campaign and to everybody's you know joy the the signal indeed turned out to be a real planet right now there's a lot in there than that summary and we're going to dive into a lot of those points that he just raised but uh it is important to note that you know the a lot of different a lot of different instruments a lot of data had gone into finding this thing now proxima centauri is the one of the closest stars to us at about what four and a half light years away correct and the closest it is the closest or let me just get specific about it and uh and so this is really, I don't know, I found it very comforting. You're not going to find, folks, a closer exoplanet that is a planet outside of our solar system anywhere. This is it. This is the closest one they found. And um, I, I want to, Avi, I, I want to ask you about something that I I had spoken to many, we, I've talked about exoplanets a lot on Hangouts and also with, with individual astronomers, and one of them, Dave Charbonneau, uh, he, was, he made a comment, and I'd like you to maybe respond, is that, Everybody's very excited about these red dwarf stars in finding exoplanets. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, and it, you know, it's it's become such of a conversation piece that it kind of has a, a tagline. David may have mentioned to you. We call it the M dwarf opportunity. Um, and the reason the reason is because 
M dwarves really um, sort of match all the perfect characteristics that you want to have um, when looking for planets using the current detection methods, which are the radial velocity method, which is uh, one of the methods mentioned by Michael, uh, and also the transit, um, exoplanet transit detection method, which is uh, another method, um, the complementary method uh, that people use. The Kepler Space Telescope uses transits. And for both of these methods of planet detection, M dwarfs actually are the perfect uh, candidate because the stars are small and um, small in radius, and so that means, and also small in mass. And so that means that a small planet can actually make a bigger impact on an M star in terms of its gravitational pull, which is what you detect for the radial velocity method, or the motion of the planet across the face of the star, which is called the transit method. Right. I want to stop you right there before you go too much further into the red dwarfs and, the, and their habitable zones. I'm just showing this animation. What We've talked about both of these methods before, the transit method and the uh, radial velocity. What I'm showing you now is an animation put out by ESO uh, that shows the radial velocity. And basically what we're looking at is, well, maybe, maybe Mark, you can tell us what we're, what we're, or Mike, I'm so sorry I keep doing that. Mike, you can tell us what we keep looking at here, what, what, what this animation is showing us. Yeah, this animation is really funny because this is exactly what we are not seeing when we observe <laughs> the star with, <laughs> with radio velocity. Okay, but, but the principle we're, but we're is trying shown. to illustrate yeah. a concept here. <laughs> So the, the principle is shown that, of course, what we do is we use the Doppler effect. So like the light of the star gets redshifted when it's uh, receding from us and blue shifted when it's coming towards us. So what happens is uh, we all learned in high school that the planets orbit the sun. Well, they actually don't. We are nitpicky. All the planets and the sun orbit the common center of mass. And that's important because that means that any planet, uh, any star that has a planetary companion, has to do this tiny orbit around the common center of mass. Uh, so we don't observe the planet at all. We just look at the, at the star. It's a totally indirect method. And measure, take spectra of the star. And you know, with this regular blue and red shifts, then you can you know, infer that there is first a companion. You get the orbital period. And from the amplitude of these Doppler shifts, you can, uh, you can estimate the mass. But why I was saying this is completely incorrect is that these shifts are not visible on these absorption lines in the spectra. If you overplot all the spectra that we take of Proxima, they would all fall on top of each other. We are looking at sig signals that are deeply buried in the, in the sub-pixel uh, regime. They're like a, a 500th of a detector pixel. Okay, so this is wildly exaggerated, I get that, but this is <laughs> the, the idea of what we're talking about, and this is how they found the exoplanet around uh, Proxima Centauri. Now, the, this, as, 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 um, as you guys were talking about, this is a good way of the, the amount of the wobble tells you some information, but it is an indirect method. What information can we get from the, from the radio velocity information about the planet itself? Yeah, you get the orbital period. And right. from the amplitude, you get the, uh, the minimum mass, which means that would be the true mass if you would look directly edge on onto the orbital plane. So if, uh, with respect to the sky in the background, the orbit is inclined by 90 degrees. And we, would get an, we also get an orbital eccentricity, so we actually get a lot of information uh, on a high-quality radio velocity orbit. So we get the, the eccentricity, so how elliptic the, the orbit is, and, and the period, so which means then the distance to the star and the minimum mass. Okay. So that's a, I just wanted to say it's a good point that Michael's making that, that just to emphasize. So if you have a star with a planet and it's going around in the plane of the sky, we're not going to see those using the radial velocity or the transit method. So there can be a lot of planets that are in that configuration because there's nothing that says that orbital planes have to be pointed at us. They could be tilted in a different way, and then we don't see them. So there are a lot more planets out there that we haven't maybe even discovered. Well, you don't see the ones that are totally pull on. So that the, there's a zero right. degree to the sky, plane of the sky, but those are the most unlikely. And as soon as you have a little tiny inclination, the radio velocity method would detect the planet. 
but you would okay. underestimate the mass dramatically if it's highly impaired. Yeah, that, and that mass part point is is something that's very important to point out. Is you know the the number that gets thrown around mostly um, for radio velocity planets is what's called the minimum mass, and for Proxima Centauri b, that would be something on the order of 1.3 Earth masses minimum. Um, the point, the key of what we're talking about, though, is that we can't, we don't know what the maximum mass of this planet might be, i.e. the range of masses that the planet might be. We have, we can estimate, you know, the most probable mass based on potential angles of the orbit and some other statistics, but we don't actually have a constraint on what this maximum mass might be. And so um, we, we, in that, in in essence, we don't really know how big the planet is. We have an estimate okay. of the, how big the planet is, but we don't actually know how big this planet is. Okay, so let me. So I want to get to some of the details of the Proxima Centauri uh, system, the schematics and the details of the specifics in just a minute. But what you're saying now is that uh, the, this minimum mass, this amount of wobble that we are currently seeing with the radio velocity in these instruments, that I don't get how that's only the minimum. I mean, what that wouldn't that be a maximum because you're seeing a, a wobble already? That's everything pulling on it, not necessarily just this planet. There might be something else. No, so, if it, well, if uh, think about it. If you look completely edge on, then you measure the total velocity vector of the star in, in that's pointing towards you and away from you, so along the line of sight. So you get the maximum Doppler effect. But if you incline the plane, then the this component of the velocity vector of the star that's that's along the line of sight shrinks. So an, a more massive object would be producing a smaller radio velocity variation in the star. It gets to the stage that for very, very highly inclined uh, orbital planes, even a stellar companion could fake a planetary type uh, signal. But that's, of course, very unlikely and basically ruled out for Proxima because we would have seen that star <laughs> by now. Even probably, we would have seen brown dwarfs, we would have seen, uh, I don't know, I, it, it depends on what the, the best direct imaging results so far could tell us about, you know, the radio velocities basically rule out even Neptunes around, around Proxima. And to go back to the statistical argument, the excitement about Proxima B is that the minimum mass is so low because, like Abi said, you can approach it from a statistical point. If you just assume completely random orientations of the orbital planes of planetary systems in the galaxy, and we have no reason not to do this, really, uh, there's a 90% chance, or the probability is 90%, that this planet has a mass less than three Earth masses. That's, that's still a very low mass planet. Absolutely. So using statistics, you can kind of get an idea of the upper limit then. Is that what you're yes. saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Avi, let's go back. Okay. So we've got we've got the uh, radio, radio velocity thing mapped out. We've sort of given this idea of minimum mass. But I want to put go back to what you were saying about this. Would you call it the opportunity, the... M star, uh, the M star opportunity. Right. The, what, the, reason, the reason it's called the M star opportunity is that, you know, for most of us, a way, uh, apart from sort of, you know, very nerdy astrophysicists who love to study all kinds of planets and all kinds of planetary systems, you know, the average person on the street really, you know, their first question out of their mouth is, well, what about the Earth-like planets? I want to know about whether there are Earths out there. And so, you know, of course, astronomers also love to find, you know, interesting planets like Earth. So the best stars to find small Earth-sized planets using the radio velocity method are the smallest stars, as I said. Um, mostly because we can sense the signal, the gravitational signal, um, of these small planets around small stars, like Michael was talking about. The other factor that's important is that um, for Earth-like planets, we would really like to find the Earth-like planets that are most like Earth in terms of their surface temperature. We want the temperature to be what we call kind of temperate, not too hot, not too cold. Some people call it the Goldilocks uh, temperature um, for Earth-like planets. And planets around M stars, the, the planets with this temperature are going to be very close to their star just because the stars are dim. So for example, Proxima Centauri b, which was just found, 
has, we think, a temperature in this, an equilibrium temperature at least, in this Goldilocks zone. Not too hot and not too cold with relation to, to water, and we can discuss that. But its orbit is only 11 days. It's only 11, it whips around the star in 11 days. So Earth whips around the sun at a you know, measly 600, 365 days for a year. This planet has a year of 11 days, and it goes through summer. I know, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna push back in a minute on this Earth-like thing, but let's go ahead and get to the schematic of it. This is this is what was included in the in the press release, and based on, and we're gonna have both of you comment on this. But here is what Avi is talking about. You can see the um, where's my let me get my uh, there we go. You can see the uh, this green area, which is what the habitable zone would be around Proxima Centauri, and you can see that the, the that its orbit is well within that green area. And so, um, but, you know, the, the idea that these dwarf class, these, uh, these M stars are great stars for having planets in orbit around them, they're also kind of they have their own issues associated with them too, which I want to, I want to get to in just a sec, but issues. An, 11 day, issues. an 11 day year yes. has a lot of implications, doesn't it, Mike? Yes. Uh, in particular, what uh, happens to these short period planets that are so close to a host star is that they get tidally locked. The same thing that happens to the moon with respect to the earth. Right. So they're always facing the same side to the star. Right. So here we have 11 days of going around. That's this year, folks, okay? And then we have what uh, what uh, Avi was telling us about this minimum mass of 1.27 uh, Earth masses. What so, else do we know about this based on the, this release? Is it just those two things? Well, so so we know the orbit, as we said, that it's, it's uh, um, it has a very low eccentricity orbit around its, its parent star. Um, we know its orbital period, it goes around in 11 days. And, and we know what would be called the equilibrium temperature, which is if the star, we know how much light the star is producing, and we know where the planet is um, in its distance from the star because of its orbital period. And so we can calculate how much radiation, how much light is reaching the planet, you know, the planet from the central star, and if that light was absorbed, similar to the way it uh, is on Earth, then we would know what temperature could be produced at the surface, uh, just from the stellar uh, radiation itself. And that we call the equilibrium temperature. Now, that temperature isn't necessarily the surface temperature. And that's where we get into more models and, and um, you know, projections of what the planet might be like in different circumstances. But we can calculate how much light the planet is getting from the star. And right, and so you could tell from this schematic that this thing is way closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. And I think I read, and correct me if I've got the number wrong, that, that Proxima B gets 60% more flux or radiation from its star than Mercury gets from the sun. Is that true? No, it gets about 65% of the Earth's radiation. Oh, Earth. From the oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes. Still, that's that okay. Earth-like, maybe not. I mean, that's a lot of radiation, isn't it? No, that's no, great. No. <laughs> it's no, no, no. Less. It gets it gets sixty percent of it. It it's gets less. You know, it's less. less. Oh, less. I read it wrong. Oh, okay, and I thought it was sixty percent more. Oh, okay, no. no, it's less. Ah. So, for, for for example, Mars in our own solar system gets sixty percent of the Earth's radiation. So, the Earth gets a hundred percent, obviously. And Mars gets 60, so Proxima Sen B would lie, based on its radiation, somewhere between Earth and Mars in terms of where it would sit. So that's on. helpful. Yeah. Well, here's yeah, a little. So that, that is that is what it, within, as you, this demo, <laughs> this uh, image says, what we would think of as the habitable zone based on modeling of planets. But I want to explain this term habitable zone. Um, it's a it's a very flashy term that everyone uses in the field because you know it sounds great to be habitable and inhabited and have you know little critters on it, but really the scientific definition of what we term this zone of interest is actually better termed the surface water zone um, in a system, and what this means is 
on the surface of the planet, you want the temperature to the equilibrium temperature to be uh, well, not the equilibrium temperature, the surface temperature to be between zero Celsius and 100 Celsius, aka between frozen water and completely evaporated, boiled off water. And so if you use models of planets to calculate what the surface temperature is, you can estimate where this zone would lie based on the radiation from the central star. But the term habitable, aka able to be inhabited, is another step beyond what we actually calculate as scientists. And I think it's really an overblown term uh, that is, that is you know, the catchy, sexy term to grab headlines, but isn't really uh, what, we're, what we're actually measuring. Right, that's a good distinction. I'm glad you did that. So let's talk, so let's talk a little bit about the star then. Here you have some information on it. It's about, uh, it's, very, it's you know, very, very small compared to the sun, only 0.12 solar masses. It's uh, very dim. What does this luminosity mean? 0.00155 solar luminosities. Is that a percentage of how mm -hmm. much comes off as, as a percentage of our sun? Yeah, it's a very faint, intrinsically faint star because it's such a low mass star. So the lower mass the stars have, the less luminous they are. And Proxima Centauri is, is already going towards the end of what we astronomers call the main sequence, where you stop basically uh, fusing hydrogen in your core. So it's it's if you go a little bit less massive, you become a brown dwarf. Okay, so this so this means it's just a little bit over a thousandth of the of the solar luminosity. And this is so this is barely a star. And here we <laughs> have, and, and here and here we have you know you got the rotation period eighty three days. It gets the, uh, the our sun by example is twenty seven days. Uh, the uh, uh, Temperature is 2,800 degrees Celsius, and it's 4.23 light years away. And you can so, tell it's in a European press release. The temperature what? of the stars in Celsius. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I get a lot of flack for that, by the way. Just you know, whenever I read a press release from the United States, it's always in Fahrenheit and and miles per hour and things like that. So it yeah, should be Kelvin. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That's true. That. It should be. That's a good point. That's right. So I hope you're going to talk about the dirty secrets about Proxima being an active star and also mm -hmm. the fact that that temperature you just pointed out gives a rather different spectrum of radiation. So where the radiation is um, impinging on the planet. And then there's the whole planet problem. Is it tidally locked? Does it have an atmosphere? Exactly. What's, the, what's the temperature to the backside? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> while this may be an M star opportunity, these stars they are they're very they, they put out a lot of radiation both in the UV and X rays, right? Yeah, and they do this in sudden outbursts, so they're kind of angry yeah. little stars. <laughs> uh, and it's, so the total luminosity on average is very low, and and the uh, like Carol said, it's a red dwarf stars, so most of the uh, energy comes out in the in the longer wavelengths. Uh, and so if you would stand on that planet, you would see uh, Proxima B three times bigger than our sun, but it would not look like our sun, it would look very orangey, reddish. And, and then there's this problem with the flares. Uh, mm -hmm. Interestingly, these little stars, they have all these activity phenomena that we know from the sun, uh, on an even bigger scale. So um, they, we, we did photometric observations of Proxima quasi simultaneous to these um, uh, precision radio velocity observations. And you see uh, almost every other day or every other week at least, you see these flares popping up. It's, it's very, very frequent. And we actually don't understand how these little stars you know, have all this frantic magnetic activity because it's it's not it cannot be explained by the physics that we know from the sun. But that means that for a very short amount of time, that that planet is bombarded with a lot of short wavelength radiation with extreme ultraviolet X rays and all of this. So any any aliens on this planet, any microbes, they better protect themselves. Okay, we're, uh, we're, oh gosh, I can't believe how much time is flying by. So the, uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about the planet where the habitable zone, a little bit about M dwarf stars. I want to talk about the discovery itself for a little bit, Mike, if you could. I, what I have here now is the paper where you were using data that, this is from the HARPS UVES uh, data that you, well, why don't you talk about this a little bit? Mm -hmm. Because I want, yeah. I want to talk about the history of the data that you used to find this and then the pale red dot uh, yeah. campaign. 
so this figure is basically the you know everything condensed into one figure what the what the paper basically presented because it shows the signal of the planet where, where is that by the and you, yeah where, so what you see there? here what you see here yeah this strong okay. spike um, is is the signal and the the x-axis as you see is always in period so we search basically the the data for signals at, at every possible period so here is just shown from the period of two to about 60 days and if something comes up like that peak at 11.2 days and it especially breaks through these uh, horizontal dashed and solid lines which are kind of statistical levels of significance then we become very excited and this is also basically an historical figure in the sense that panel A is that figure that that Guillaume and Glada and Miku Tuomi got when they combined all the archival data. So at that point, I of, of course looked back at my US results and that peak is also there, but US alone, with our US data, we saw other random peaks showing up with similar strength, so we couldn't, I didn't even see that this is any any candidate signal. So but HARPS then, is a spectrograph, but what's US? Tell us what that is. What is US this? is another spectrograph at okay. the ESO VLT. Okay. So we started observing it with the ESO VLT and the UV spectrograph for precision radio velocities. And then after we stopped, the HARPS group at the 3.6 meter telescope took over. So this, so, yeah. I'm just, so this is the historical data that you looked at. And mm -hmm. in hindsight, you said, wow, it's obvious. Look, there's a planet there. But uh, no, no, I just, I just said, yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Okay. There it is, but we couldn't tell. We could not tell at that point of time that this is really a, a planetary signal. So even though it was suspected that this planet might be here, it wasn't very convincing. And so w tell us a little <laughs> bit about the follow-up right. observations of this year. The yeah. A little bit about what Pale Red Dot is and yeah. what they did. So this is exactly how science works, right? When you have a candidate signal and you want to figure out whether it's a, a true signal or just a random noise peak, you design an experiment to test this. I mean, the hypothesis is that there is a planetary companion. It would be exciting because it's in the habitable zone around Proxima Centauri. So Guillaume went ahead and asked for a lot of observing time at, uh, at HARPS. Uh, and basically he asked Lisa to give him, every night they open up the dome, <laughs> one radio velocity measurement of Proxima Centauri. Excellent. Yeah, and that happened earlier this this year from basically beginning of january to end of march and the duty cycle was was very high it was i think about 90 percent so how it was 60 how, nights yeah how much observing like how much exposure time does it take in a single night to get a single rate of velocity not measure? much so the total observing time was actually not a lot of time to ask because you're focusing on only on one star where you have maybe an exposure time of 10 minutes yes. or 15 minutes. So it's not, the total time was not a lot, but they, they needed, of course, to have a program where they were sure that they get a spectrum or a radio velocity measurement every night. Because if, it, if your signal is at 11 days, you really want to sample it very, very uh, densely. And that was the, the, you know, the success of the Pale Red Dot campaign. That's an important point. If you've got yeah. a period that's so short, you want to get a lot of data points while it's rotating around. That's right. Or revolving around the star. So if you go back to that figure of the of the signals in the paper. Okay. Here you go. If you just look at the at, at this pale red dot campaign data alone, you get panel B. This one. See? Yeah. Yeah. And then combining all of them, you get panel C. And this is basically, it was our main argument to say this is indeed a planet because you get only a situation like this, that the signal gets stronger if you combine all kind of various uh, different data sets with different, uh, you know, sampling, different precision. If the signal is present in all data sets at the same period and in the same phase. And that's exactly how a planet should look like. What is that thing out at 45 days? Here? Yeah. Oh, that's just noise. You see the, um, yeah, you see the, these horizontal lines? They basically yeah. tell you a, a significance yeah, but, level. But, 
Okay, so in B, there's that thing too. What is that? At 45 days. There is power. If you, it's not shown here, or power, there, there are signals popping up at longer periods that are, uh, we think, you know, probably due to the star, which has a rotation period of 80, 80 days. Mm. And could be planets uh, as well, but we can't, we didn't identify any any other additional planets in the system yet. I bet there are. <laughs> okay, well, this this leads into a, a tweet that uh, Yurik Mazano has asked a, a while back, and I wanted to get to it since we're talking about it now. He's asking, how accurate is the discovery of the Earth-sized planet around uh, the, the star? And we haven't gone we haven't gone there, so verification, margin for error, et cetera. So basically, this is how you know. These, these <clears throat> horizontal lines are your confidence levels, right? Yes. Okay. Maybe you should talk a little bit about them, because I don't understand them. The the 10% FAP, 1%, 0.1%, I don't understand yeah. what that means. FAP stands for false alarm probability. So if you have a 10% false alarm probability, you have a 90% probability your signal is a true signal and not just some noise peak. I see. And if you go above the 0.1%, then it's already one uh, part in a thousand. So here you go. This thing is huge. This is very it's way high. over. Yeah, it's 10 to the minus 7. Okay, so this is pretty convincing. Yeah. Also, even in just the pale red dot data in panel B, it's above that. But it mm -hmm. isn't quite there in panel exactly. A. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's what you're getting at. So this is, you know, this goes to that comment, Yurik, about what you were asking. This is how they know. This is why they're confident. They needed more observations, and these pale red dot observations uh, helped fill in the gaps. Can you tell us a little bit, either one of you, if, uh, but, but uh, let us know a little bit about what pale red dot is, what they're doing, and what their goals are. What well, that's mean? that's the name of the campaign. So, uh, just this campaign, just just, just this campaign. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's more than just the Harps campaign. There was a, a two telescopes also utilized to do quasi simultaneous photometry, which was then used to um, you know to make sure that we're not fooled by anything that that shows up also in the photometry due to star spots and and, and whatnot. And well, there's, there was also a big public outreach uh, part of it. So there's a, a website, palered.org, that has all kinds of. Red dot dot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> palered.org. And, <laughs> and, and there, there you find, for instance, uh, many blog entries from the, from the astronomers involved. And, and okay, so yeah. The, yeah. the interesting so the, the interesting thing about this is that most um, observing campaigns and science campaigns in general don't really get sort of a flashy name <laughs> like this yeah. one. And, they, and they don't really do such um, public uh, outreach and sort of um, publicity generation but this is becoming much more common in science today and I think it's really a product a lot of the of the internet and social media age that we're that we live in these days is that to to really generate attention and focus and and excitement about what you're doing you can't just be publishing in a you know a dry musty journal somewhere um, you know that that no one reads because um, your stakeholders and the public want to see your results um, and even before your results they want to feel like they're participating in the campaign um, that their tax money and their, you know, their observing time is going to. And so more and more science campaigns are really getting out in front and, uh, and making an effort to connect with, with both uh, you know, the observatories and stakeholders as well as the public um, during, during the campaign. And yeah, so, Carol has the web page up now. It can replete with a selfie right on the front home page. So it goes to your point about the internet age. There's even, there's even a selfie on here. So yes, we can follow along as it as it went around. So speaking of social media, we've got a lot of people coming and commenting now. Thank you, uh, guys. Uh, Andrew Planet is on Twitter. Hi, Andrew. Welcome back. It's good to see you as always. Um, and he's asking a good question that I want to direct at you, Avi. He's going, is Proxima Centauri at least now a better candidate for colonization outside the solar system if we dare look that much ahead. Now, what I'm going to do with this question is while he's asking about colonization, I want to talk about Earth-like and habitability based on what we know about this planet. Right. How habitable well, is it? Well, first, even if there's liquid water rivers everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first, though, I want to address, you know, just 
the pure excitement of finding a Earth-sized, potentially, even if it's just potential, you know, Earth climate type planet. Yeah, because around... we don't even know it has an atmosphere, do we? No, 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 no. But just the potential of a planet like this around the nearest star is really, I mean, just incredibly exciting. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's okay. just the. <laughs> They're calling you. <laughs> don't say that, Avi. Don't say that. What are you doing? <laughs> it's just spectacular to have this opportunity, not you know, to study it you know remotely, but even to just consider these ideas um, for the far, far future about going to the nearest star, not just to you know look about you know ju not just to sort of find out what's going on. <laughs> they really want to actually have the Really persistent. To get on to get onto a planet. So, um, so first that, but that, but then back to this question of what is the planet actually like, um, and I think that's the that's where a lot of this uncertainty um, really comes in because, as you pointed out, Tony, Earth mass and Earth sized, and even an equilibrium temperature close to Earth tells us absolutely nothing about what the surface of the planet or the atmosphere of the planet is actually like. Um, all we know is that there's a big object orbiting Proxima Centauri <laughs> B with the mass close to that of Earth, you know, and the temperature on the surface um, based on its radiation. But we don't know even that it has a thin atmosphere like Earth versus a thick atmosphere like Neptune, for example. We do probably know that it's not a Jupiter, but it could be a, what we call a mini-Neptune, which is a, a hydrogen-rich atmosphere like Neptune um, versus a thin, you know, skin-like atmosphere full of nitrogen like Earth. So even even that respect, we don't know what the planet is like. Really? Um, so it could be even more like a gas giant than a rocky planet? Be. It okay. could be. And um, in terms of the surface temperature, we don't really know whether it's actually you know, a temperature that can support liquid water or not. Earth's equilibrium temperature is actually below the temperature that water would freeze. If you just calculated Earth's equilibrium temperature, it's actually below the freezing point of water. But we have this beautiful blanket covering our planet called... Oh, good point. Atmosphere. Yep. It's, you know, everyone knows about the greenhouse effect. Our atmosphere on planet Earth actually keeps in a lot of the heat and raises the surface temperature up sufficiently so that we are able to have uh, liquid water and plants and animals and everything else that we have on our surface. However, we also know that planets like Venus have way too much greenhouse um, warming and their surface temperature can rise to hundreds of degrees or uh, beyond uh, far beyond the boiling point of water. So we have really no idea what the surface of this planet uh, really is like. And um, However, we do have the chance to investigate that uh, in the future. And I can tell you, people are already, you know, in coffee talks like this and team meetings in scientific institutions all around the world, scientists are hatching plans to try to figure okay, out. Okay, I want to come back to that. But before I do, I want to get Mike's comment on that that, that issue. Based on what we know about this, this what, we, what you guys have found out with your observations, we know the kind of star Proxima Centauri is. We know uh, that it's probably tidally locked, that the thing has all these equilibrium temperatures. But really, what else coming? I mean, you can make, we know how much radiation is coming from this thing with the star. We can kind of get some idea, right? What are your thoughts on habitability of this planet? Yeah, currently it's really a lot of speculation. I mean, we, yeah. uh, as you know, and as we really, and it's important to clarify this, what we know about this planet, really, what the data currently includes. So nobody, you know, stay, says and goes out there and says, this is definitely habitable world, there's life there, and it has an atmosphere and all this. The major excitement about this discovery comes from the opportunity that now in the next years or at least few decades, we will be able to answer most of these uh, questions, you know, whether it has an atmosphere, whether it, you know, hopefully we can determine its, its mean See, density, you're not, its You're not going to get them away from talking about future telescopes, Tony. I'm not going <laughs> to <that. We're laughs> go next. Want to, I yes. want to talk about habitability first. We're yeah. going there next. <laughs> so we basically, now with this discovery, you give somebody who was always interested to study exoplanets in terms for habitability, you give them a, a great target. 
Okay. But currently, we cannot say anything about the habitability, really. Okay, well then, let's go. Yurik uh, Mazno is also on Twitter asking, by the way, you guys are using the live chat. Thank you guys very much. I'm going to get to those in a minute. Uh, he's going, well, after detection, which we've just done, and, the, and I think the big news and the excitement, as we've all said here, is the fact that this thing is here at all is great. Um, but he goes, what's next? What are the next steps of study? And then I'm going to have Avi start, and then I'll go with you, Michael, and talk <laughs> about ground-based things. So let's go. What's NASA going to do about this? Wait, we got space so telescopes on the way? No, no, yes. I wanted to just finish off because even oh. though we don't know anything about the actual, you know, surface conditions on this planet, as Mike says, Mike says, that doesn't stop scientists from wild speculation about <laughs> what the atmosphere might be like. So scientists are, you know, happy to throw out all their theories about what might be the case. So hence, hence pictures like this, right? So we have this kind of thing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From, 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 from ESO. That's right. This is also from ESO, an <laughs> artist from conception, from speculation. Exactly. That's the I'm glad you showed that. Yeah. Yes. Right. You have to make it clear to people that we did not see this. This is not like, first. <laughs> right. photo. This is yeah. speculation. Yeah, yeah we, were not, we were not standing on that coastline. No. Except but, for this part here. This gives you an idea how big it is in its sky, right? That's that's more or less accurate, right? And there's Alpha Centauri, which Sorry, is also right. And there's where they – that's right. So there you go. That's That and much the, is true. The other thing, as I'll say, is that whatever it is, it'll be completely different. <laughs> Whatever, that's right. whatever speculation, yeah. because it's always a surprise. That's Almost right. Every we, planet that we found, it's like, oh, really? It's that yeah. hot? It's that cool? It's got that in it? Doesn't have that? It has yeah. clouds? Doesn't have clouds? All that stuff. So, so as much as we would like for this to be an image from a rover, it isn't. <laughs> Not yet. Yes. But but you can so let's say you make the you let's say you accept the basic idea that this planet has an atmosphere of the same general pressure and composition as Earth. The question is, would this planet be habitable or have a surface would it have a surface temperature to a, allow liquid water or not? The real problem, as Michael and I think Tony also pointed out, is this question of tidal locking. Because the planet is so close to the star, one face of the planet constantly um, faces the star in its whole orbit. And that's just weird. I'm sorry for life. That's just plain weird. Well, and I'm always worried about it because the, the other side is too cold to visit. Yes, but that's not actually the case. And if you have an atmosphere... If you have an atmosphere, it could be different. As I said, if you start with the, the assumption that the atmosphere is similar to Earth or in the same general um, you know, qualities as Earth, the atmosphere would actually transfer all the heat that you're getting from one side of the planet to the dark side of the planet through winds and convection. Yeah, it and might be heat. too windy. It, it might be it very might windy. Be very windy. <laughs> um, it would be very windy, but that doesn't, you know, no one's ever said that, you know, a gust of wind is really detrimental to um, to life. In, well, at no, least, in uh, fact, we find life on Earth in some pretty inhospitable places. So exactly. pretty tenacious. So, mm -hmm. Uh, we we do know from these what we call general circulation models show you know modeling these winds and atmospheric conditions that the these planets have actually if they have temp atmospheres like Earth they have a very good chance of having a temperature similar to Earth on at least part of the planet so so being an M star um, you know habitable or Earth sized planet doesn't rule out habitability. Okay. What do we know about the 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 composition? Of Proxima. Oh, in terms the of the composition of the star. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Michael. Yeah. Well, it's um, uh, it's actually, for instance, it's heavy metal content. It's not absolutely uh, well determined because these M dwarf spectra are kind of messy. But it seems all the data that that I've seen that it's consistent with what we know from A and B from the more solar type stars. So right. the picture is kind of consistent that, that these three stars form together. Ah, okay. Cool. All right. That's good. Yes. Um, okay, good. we're running out of time. I only have 10, 11 minutes left, and I, we, I want to talk about the future. Michael, yes? the future of future <laughs> observations. And I'm going to go to you, uh, Avi, about NASA's goals. So what's next? Are we going to – you said we're going to – now that we know it's there – we're going to be studying mm -hmm. the crap out of this system, aren't we? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, 
that's what we did kind of in 2000 at the beginning of 2016 so we now do something completely different no i'm <laughs> kidding um uh so <laughs> the the next big thing of course is to verify and to see and to really carefully check whether we are not even even more lucky that this planet actually transits proxima centauri and that, uh, means, that means it goes in front of the yes. star between mm -hmm. us and the line of sight of the star, right? Yeah, it's okay. very unlikely. It's just, uh, you know, about 1.5% the probability that, the, that it does. But uh, if that would be the case, you know, we would be, it, this would be just absolutely wonderful. You can't imagine because then every big telescope and even maybe smaller te uh, aperture telescope, but in particular, JWST, it's going to get launched in two years. It's going to look at that, uh, those transits, and we're going to do transmission spectroscopy, meaning we're going to probe whether there is an atmosphere. And we can even probe then whether that atmosphere contains certain you know, gases. And, and ultimately, you know, that would be fantastic to look for biosignatures even. Can we, can we figure out if it's, a transit meth, if it's a transit now on the ground using ground-based yeah. telescopes? Or can, yes. can Hubble help us? Can we figure that out before JWST launches? Yes. No, definitely. This will be figured out in the next few months. Oh, oh okay, good. So yeah. it's on everybody's yeah. plate and it'll be the next conference. Absolutely. Okay, Everybody's looking up yeah. for it. So <laughs> you, can, you can search for transits from the ground. You can do a very good search of whether there is a dip in the light from the star from the ground. The thing that's very hard from the ground is actually the second part, which Michael was talking about, about actually determining the gases or even whether there is an atmosphere or not on the planet and that's because you really are if you think about it you're really looking for the same or close to the same gases on that planet that you actually have in our own atmosphere above the telescopes on the ground um, and so uh, it's not phys it's not physically impossible to do this from ground-based telescopes and we're getting better at it over every year, but really when you're actually looking for gases in the atmosphere of a planet, space, space-based platforms are the best uh, telescopes. And the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the JWST that Michael mentioned, is the next big flagship space telescope that NASA is going to be launching uh, in, the, in the next two years, in fall of 2018. And that will have the perfect capabilities to do this type of work. That Michael's talking about. Well, Carol, let me just ask you, since you're an HST person, what, what can Hubble help us at all with this? It, maybe, maybe seeing any of these transits. Or is there any, or is it is it too is is Hubble not? The, right. have I don't here? know. Actually, Michael should answer that question. But it seems like I mean we've done transits with Hubble, but it'd be a lot of observing time, I believe. Yeah. Okay. All right. So well, we're looking. Well, let me answer that because we actually, I'm one of the um, researchers who actually uses Hubble quite a bit for these types of transit spectroscopy, transmission spectroscopy measurements. And if Proxima Centauri B does actually transit its star, then it actually makes things much, much easier. It actually, because of the M star opportunity I'm talking about, a small planet around a small star isn't actually necessarily that hard to do. One complicating factor are flares and stellar activity, yeah. as Michael mentioned. That's always a complication with M stars. But we've been doing this type of work for other M star transiting planets already. We've determined that there yeah. are clouds, sometimes even water detections around small planets. So it is possible with HST. But, but it would be tedious, right, to try to find the transit, if I understood the question. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right? Finding, right? The Finding it would be hard. Right. And as Michael said, it, there's actually a very low probability of transit. So most scientists, you know, are assuming, as Michael, I think, is probably assuming, that we won't see. We won't okay, transit. well, let's go there then. So, yeah, let's say we're not lucky that it doesn't transit uh, in a way that we can that we can see any dips in brightness. Will JWST or successor telescopes be able to maybe find it in some other way? Look at it. Can you resolve this thing, for example, with a coronagraph or something blocking out the star's light? No. <laughs> too small? Too close to the star. Too close, yeah. okay. So for current for current telescopes, it is too close. It's it's at around um, a sort of probably about a quarter of the distance, you know. You would have to be four times better, closer observe four times closer to the star than current telescopes can actually get. So it's current telescopes have a 
exclusion zone around a star. They can't see because the star is too bright, like a giant spotlight. Um, and this, the planet is inside the region, which you can't look because you have this glaring bright star that you have to try to, to look around. So current telescopes from the ground or space, not even James Webb or any of these other telescopes won't be able to do it um, because it's too close. Um, however, we are working on future telescopes um, that will have this capability. And in particular, uh, Michael, I'm sure, is looking forward eagerly to telescopes like the, the Giant Magellan Telescope mm -hmm. on the ground, um, which is the next generation after the current VLT and, and other large telescopes. It will be 30, three times as big, hopefully, as the current telescopes. And more importantly, will have extremely good optics able to remove and bring this range around the star smaller and smaller and smaller until you're able to pick out the planet. Uh, so that. Magellan's being built now? The giant Magellan telescope, yes. It's, it's, they're starting building it right now. It's going to become available as the first one of the three big next generation uh, ground-based telescopes and hopefully becoming online in the mid-2020s. Good. And Will this be in South, uh, South America? It's, yeah, it's, it's in Chile on Las Campanas, uh, and we'll have a direct view to Proxima. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. The Euro Europeans are planning even in a, a larger telescope in the Atacama Desert, the EELT. And their advanced you know, adaptive optics systems might have a chance but to find that particular planet. But we must not forget that there, are other, there might be other planets in that system anyway. So just looking for those now, with whatever we have now, even in imaging, would be, would be beneficial. Because then we could assume, for instance, coplanarity of the whole uh, planetary system. And if you can follow one of the outer planets that we haven't seen yet in the radio velocity, in the imaging, then we can uh, determine actually the mass of the 11.2-day of the planet huh. this way. Okay, well, we're running. I've only had a couple minutes left, and you guys, I got to get to the live forum on the website. Thank you guys for using it. Seems to be working. There's a lot of comments and chat happening on deepastronomy.com/slash live. But I want to get to something that George Caldwell, who's also been a lot of a hangout, so it's good to see you also again, George. Thanks for taking time out to comment. Um, he says that red dwarfs can live for trillions of years, um, and I I want to get to that for a minute because that has significant impact on whether life can form, right? I mean, the advantage to having a star, our sun is around roughly 10 billion years. That'll be its total lifespan. Life has to emerge, evolve, and do what, do its thing here, which it's done. But on a red dwarf star that can last for trillions of years, that has certain advantages, right? Can you guys comment on that? Yeah, I think this is a super interesting question. But I think the big question, the big uh, you know, gorilla in the room currently is that we don't know what it takes for life to start. In the I first know. Place. That's what bothers me too. Yeah. yeah. So, How hard is it to go from yeah, primordial soup yeah. to life? That's <laughs> exactly. what I want to know. So on Earth, we have now evidence that this happened quite quickly. Uh, but can we really conclude from this that it's a, it's a very common natural you know, process that happens every time the conditions are somewhat similar and right? As an optimist, I would say yes. And that would mean, yeah, I mean, in, for us, actually, you know, the Earth departs the habitable zone much earlier than in four uh, giga years from now because the sun is just getting brighter. So it's, it's, it's over much earlier, like in 500 million years or a giga year from now. But um, for, for Proxima, if life started, I'm sure that the evolution will just make those life very adapted to the current condition on this planet. And who knows what happens in, in trillions of years of evolution. Exactly. I mean, life can only benefit from time, right? If you give it enough time, then maybe something, the chances of it happening, regardless of how hard it may or may not be, could, could in fact... Uh, and it's also it's true there are lots of M dwarfs, right? Oh, yeah. So we'll give, it, we'll give totally us the outnumber. They totally outnumber the, the solar type stars by far. Yeah, so yes. they're the most common stars in the universe. They, they shine the longest. There's and, a lot of advantages. That's the opportunity you were talking about, right, Avi? But no uh, well, cell phones because of the flares. <laughs> and, and we think that the Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone are two times more common around M stars than they are around stars like our sun. So not only are there more stars, 
there's more Earth-sized planets around those stars in the, in the habitable zone, the liquid water zone. So chances are very good that that will be the first type of planet, Earth-sized planet, that we will look for life on in the future. Right. Yeah, very exciting. Okay, folks, well, we're running out of time. George Caldwell, you're saying so many question marks surrounding this planet. That's very true. Uh, but we, but as, as, uh, as Mike has pointed out, we are going to be looking at it a lot more uh, with a lot of different telescopes. Atmosphere, he's also commenting atmospheric pressure could also determine whether or not water can exist on the surface of the planets. That's true. Atmosphere is pretty important, but the pressure on that is also going to determine whether we find any liquid water there is a lot. There's so much to learn about Proxima Centauri B. And I will and I'm hoping you guys will, as you get more information, will you guys will you guys join us again, Mike and Avi? Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Well That's this great. all right. And Carol, we did our first one. What do you think? This is our first Good. It was very exciting. It was, <laughs> it was very exciting. It's it was great. Yes. Yeah, it went very well. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Mike, I want to thank you my guests. You guys were great. Thanks for taking the time with us. That's right. Dr. Mike and Endel, sure. he's an astronomer at McDonald Observatory, as well as Avi Mandel, who's a scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, looking into exoplanet research. Thank you both very much for taking time to talk to us about this. And we will look forward to having you back in future Hangouts. And I hope you guys will also come back in the future. We will be back next week, where we will be, uh, I think next week is the future in space hangout so we will see you then thank you guys all for watching and i want to thank all of our guests and uh, until next time keep looking up <laughs>